The pandemic has disrupted education for our kids. What is the state of schools and of learning at home? Joining us today are Jesse Ryan, board president of Sacramento City Unified School District, Jorge Aguilar, superintendent of Sac City Schools, and Larry Ferlazzo, teacher at Luther Burbank High School. Larry, what is a typical school day like now for the kids of Sac City Unified? Well, I think it, it varies from teacher to teacher and school to school, but I can tell you about what my day looks like and what my students' days look like. Uh, typically at 9.30, we start a half hour live class that I have with English language learner newcomers who have been to the United States for a year or less. And uh, after that, I generally have some individual meetings with each of the students. And then a little later in the day with my other classes that are in the International Baccalaureate program, I have some live Zoom classes where students present oral presentations that they've been working on. And in between, I'm texting students, students are texting me, I'm calling parents, following up with them to find out if students didn't attend the class, why they're not there. And I'm also checking with students who are going through crises and you know their families are out of work. Some of them uh, have taken low wage jobs to help support their families. So ongoing social emotional support for people. In addition to having meetings with colleagues, virtual meetings with colleagues and administrators. President Ryan, when you all just made the decision to essentially shut down the traditional school year, take us back to that day and tell us how that decision was made. Absolutely, Scott. Well, it was an incredibly difficult decision. Um, as you know, the science was changing day to day. We were getting new information almost hourly and for our board, for our superintendent, and for our school community, we had to consider not just the science, but recognize that for so many children in our high poverty schools, schools are more than just a place. They are a safe haven. They're where our kids will get their meals every day. It's where they'll come in contact with a caring adult like Larry, where they'll have an opportunity to touch base with friends who keep them motivated and on track. And so as we were taking into account the science, we also had to figure out how do we really quickly respond to the basic needs of students in a high poverty school district who we knew once our schools closed would find themselves in great distress. Hmm. And Superintendent Aguilar, how is it that you're measuring progress in the midst of this tumultuous change, particularly when you're talking about the younger grades? Well, there's a variety of ways, um, Scott. I, I do want to just echo uh, what President Ryan said. I mean, this happened so quickly that in a matter of weeks, we had to build, everybody had to build a new distance learning program. Um, and I just want to just emphasize what Mr. Ferlazzo uh, talked about. You can imagine uh, the anguish and anxiety that we felt about the loss of learning that was going to take place, particularly for a population that Mr. Ferlazzo serves, newcomer students that have been here for less than a year, for example. And let me just recognize Mr. Ferlazzo, he's probably too modest uh, to say this, but you can read about his work, his blogs um, in national outlets. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have teachers like Mr. Ferlazzo. But it is really critical that we very quickly determine ways in which we can measure the value of distance learning. Um, how is it that we can continue to provide uh, academic, social, and emotional supports to our students remotely? Um, and we have a wonderful team that's doing that. So we are monitoring every time that a social worker, that a counselor is communicating with our students. We're also measuring their engagement, how they're feeling. Um, how they're handling some of the stress that they're feeling that Mr. Ferlazzo also mentioned. Um, our parents have the same rights that they used to have when we were operating normally, uh, and we stand ready to meet uh, the academic, social, and emotional needs of our students. Larry, you have written extensively about this, and from reading your blogs and 
uh, the, the article that was recently done in the Washington Post, um, it seems that, that this platform has really gotten what I'd call a mixed grade at this point. Tell us a little bit about your biggest worries about the format and some of the challenges that you're working every day to overcome. Yeah, and I, I would almost suggest that it, it hasn't gotten a mixed grade, but generally it's gotten a negative grade from most teachers, students, and parents. Really? Uh, that I think, you know, there's been a lot of, there were a lot of, of hopes by ed tech visionaries that ed tech would be the way to go for the future. But clearly from students, uh, students are really missing the classroom, missing the support that they get from their classmates and from their teacher. And, you know, parents are clearly missing uh, having their, their, their children in the classroom uh, so that they don't have to also be teachers. And teachers are not at all thrilled generally by the situation because it's, it's a new environment, it's a challenging environment, and we're in this work because we want to be uh, consciously supporting students when they need it, right? And oftentimes students need a lot of support and they're not online, right? I mean, that they can't necessarily be even on our live classes. Uh, Ed Education Week recently did a national survey and just in the past two weeks, student engagement nationally has gone down by half, right? Because not only are we competing with issues of students having to work or providing childcare, providing elder care, but also we're competing against getting more sleep and video games, right? And, uh, you know, many students come to school not necessarily only because of wanting to learn, but because they want the social connection. And so, it, you know, it's, they're missing that. So it's clearly, I don't, I, I think clearly the overall judgment is despite the, our best efforts of parents and teachers and districts, this is uh, certainly a less desired way to teach students in a far less effective way as well. Not to, not to be flip about this, but it is kind of ironic to hear from a teacher in high school that kids are clamoring to come back to school. <laughs> it, is, it is ironic every time, every time. And I, I ask students, how are you feeling? Uh, it is not, I'm not exaggerating by saying every time is, I'm bored, I want to be in school, I miss school. Now, at, at the same time, Superintendent, I want to come back to you for a moment, because um, the, this pandemic has forced the district to start using muscles it didn't know it had or to develop new muscles. Uh, from your perspective, looking at the entire district, are there things that, that you believe in, and actually President Ryan, I, I would ask you the, um, to uh, also respond to this, that think will survive when we go back to a traditional school year because it's, it's either been helpful or could, there are some things to leverage in this new experience. You know, my belief, Scott, is that there are going to be components of distance learning that may prove to be valuable for students. Now, the question is, how do we begin to work uh, very arduously to figure out um, how we measure some of these components? Uh, we are right now tracking, for example, uh, the rate of engagement of our students. And Mr. Ferlazzo is right. Unfortunately, we have um, a number of students that we haven't been able to reach. Uh, for, a ver for a variety of reasons. Um, but I also um, am very open-minded that there may be some learnings uh, through this journey, for example, in how we provide some social and academic supports to our students. Uh, students may feel more comfortable approaching um, one of our counselors uh, online through this kind of platform. Um, in terms of learning, um, you know, this is, that's going to be really probably the biggest challenge is how do we assess learning during this time period 
um, without formative common assessments, for example, uh, that are district-wide because we still see a wide variation in what we're seeing in terms of the level of activity and the level of engagement, both from our students as well as from our educators. Um, so, you know, it's the world that we're operating in right now. It happened very quickly, and now is the time to start thinking a little bit more critically about what are things that we can measure to try to identify some of those best practices that, in fact, we may want to scale. Um, but but it, it isn't ideal. Um, and I can say that um, as a parent of three children in Sac City as well, there is still some variation. Um, and, you know, if this were to continue, we would have to address that, I think, as, a, as an education sector. President Ryan. Well, I will tell you, I've used the analogy that distance learning very much feels like building a plane midair. We were forced into this and, and recognize that it's not distance learning in many ways, and you've heard this term, it's crisis learning. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't bright spots. Uh, like the superintendent, I'm a parent of children in the district. I actually have the bird's eye view of what it's like to be a second grader and a fourth grader navigating this new way of learning. And for me, as an adoptive mother, I see how my nine-year-old is responding, having come to our family at four years old with no foundational learning and having to catch up to the K-12 system, she is continuing to have to figure out how does she fill in the educational gaps. But I think what's been remarkable for me is seeing how my second grader and fourth grader are now confidently navigating technology in a way that they never were before. They were not a privileged family that had access to devices before remote learning began. They actually now get themselves ready in the morning. They sign online at 8.30 and 9 a.m. with their teachers and their Zoom classes, and they are the ones who are contributing to the class online and taking ownership of how they show up in that class each and every day. And for me, that has been really character building, the responsibility of that. But I will also tell you, they have remarkable connections with their teachers who go above and beyond. They have sent them handwritten notes that have come in the mail. They have called them to check in and see how they're doing, like Larry shared, he's doing with his class members. And for them, that has been critical to just ensuring their emotional well being as they're trying to continue to learn in this new environment. You know, uh, because both you and the superintendent are parents who have kids in the district right now, I do want to ask you. President Ryan, is in some ways, and we all understand how negative uh, this entire pandemic ex experience has been uh, on disrupting our lives. However, um, is the exposure of parents like yourself and the superintendent to what it is that teachers like Mr. Ferlazzo have to deal with every single day in educating our kids, is that exposure in some ways a good thing for parents district-wide to experience and nationwide to experience in giving a little bit more empathy for the challenge that the district and its teachers have every single day in trying to do the best for their kids? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I will tell you, if I didn't understand fully how difficult it is to be a gifted educator before, um, seeing firsthand what it means to try and hold the attention of dozens of students online, um, I have been gifted uh, this remarkable understanding of what our teachers have to navigate day in, day out. The classroom environment's different. You get to respond to students in real time in a way that, you know, despite best intentions, it's very difficult to do when you are looking across the computer screen. What I also will say as a parent is even parents with the best intentions, and I actually have several parent friends who are teachers or faculty at community colleges or faculty at the California State University system, they are struggling to fill the gap 
created by distance learning. And they are struggling to be able to do all that their wonderful teachers do. And so, yes, I think that it gives us a greater understanding of what it means to be part of a classroom day in, day out. Um, and, you know, moving forward, I think we're going to have to figure out how can we take the gems and bright spots that the superintendent alluded to and incorporate that into the classroom experience that we will try to re-enter once the world returns to some form of normalcy. Mm -hmm. Larry, when you uh, look at your students and you had shared with me that you have spent time trying to reach out to every single one of your students during this time, what is your biggest fear when we come to the end of this and um, they, they mark the end by either their graduation and moving on to a different grade or graduating from high school? What are you most concerned about that they're not going to be taking with them that under normal circumstances they would? Well, certainly for seniors who are graduating this year, you know, the loss of the last three months of, of your 12-year school career is going to be a blow. Uh, I think they most will recover, but, it, you know, it is, this is not the kind of memory that most of us would like to take from our senior year. You know, for others, the, the impact, I think, to a large extent will depend upon where we go from here. If we make plans in the context of equity uh, and not equality, in other words, let's not go forward looking at treating all students the same, but instead through the lens of equity, looking at how can we support those students who are in particularly vulnerable populations like English language learners, students with special needs, students who are academically challenged. And as we make plans going forward, how can we provide additional support to them so that they are able to be successful and not be left behind academically and in other ways? That I think that's gonna be the key point. Mr. Superintendent, I saw you nodding your head vigorously. And I know that you've spoken in the past about equity, particularly with regards to education. Why were, we, why were you nodding your head so vigorously? Tell us a little bit about what, what was going on as uh, Larry was speaking. Well, I think uh, Mr. Ferlazzo makes an excellent point. Um, because of the tension that exists between what he mentioned, right, equity and equality. Um, and, um, you know, equity is a term that's been thrown around a lot over the past few years. Um, and actualizing a vision of equity is much harder uh, to do than just using the term itself. Um, I, I, as superintendent, uh, would not be able to sit here and tell you that before uh, our school closures that every single one of our students was engaged uh, academically or that we were meeting every single one of their social and emotional needs. We had students that were already disengaged uh, prior to the school closure. Um, we had many students that were on the cusp of disengagement prior to the school closure. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine the pain and anxiety that, um, that I feel, that our Board of Education, that many of our educators feel at the idea that in communities like Sacramento, there is a summer loss phenomenon that is real. Students leave for summer and come back with, with, with less academic uh, knowledge uh, in, in, in them. Um, well, you can imagine now, this is basically a spring and summer loss for many of those students. And so how do we um, um, reconcile this tension between equity and equality and recognize that we, in fact, um, are seeing some of these inequities manifest themselves in ways that are much more obvious and much starker than they were when we were still operating normally? Um, we are very committed to try to figure out how to meet the needs of our most vulnerable populations. And that starts with those that we haven't been able to reach, um, in fact. Um, but those students that Mr. Ferlazzo uh, serves, newcomer students, homeless students, our foster youth students, our students with disabilities, 
um, are low-income students. I mean, Sac City is a district that serves almost three out of four students who are low-income English learners or foster and homeless. Um, and there will be a real impact in loss of learning. And as we're starting to realize and learn um, from, uh, from researchers uh, and others, um, there is going to be a real impact on the social and emotional well-being of our students, as well as many of our adults. President Ryan, when we talk about equity and equality, you speak uh, a lot about how Sac City Unified provides a range of supports and services to its uh, children and, it, and the general community that go far beyond just the educational day. Can you speak a little bit to what that looks like and the things that most people don't realize that Sac City Unified is involved with in the community? I'm happy to. Um, I think you know, Scott, that I live in Oak Park, and I actually was a product of Sacramento area schools. I went to eight schools between kindergarten and high school by virtue of being raised by a struggling single mother. So I say that to share that I understand and have lived the experiences of so many of our students. And what I know firsthand is that you cannot learn unless your basic needs are being met. So while more privileged families were talking about how do we transition to online learning immediately after school closures? Let me tell you what was happening in my backyard. In my backyard, down the street, we have two of our highest poverty schools. We have Oak Ridge Elementary and Father Keith B. Kenny. Immediately, my phone, our principal's phones were ringing off the hook with families who were afraid that they weren't going to have access to food anymore. They wanted to know that we were going to continue our meal service because they depend on their neighborhood schools for breakfast every day for their children, for their lunches, and even for early suppers and afternoon snacks. And immediately, when we reopened and began serving just to serve food, we had families who asked me, you know, Jesse, can I take an extra meal because I have a niece or nephew at home or someone else who is also feeling hungry? They were wondering how they were going to be able to have milk for their refrigerator to be able to give their children milk in the morning and find diapers because they were running out of diapers. I mean, this is the reality. And, and what I had seen is that our schools had stepped up in a major way. We've served over a million meals at 31 sites throughout the district. But beyond that, we have incredible principals and teachers who have been driving vans to deliver meals and at other provisions to families in need in some of our most challenged communities throughout Sac City. Beyond that, you know, internet access, device access, huge issue. We have distributed more devices than any other district in the region because for most of our families, they did not have access to a device other than a phone at home. Asking them to be able to get online was like asking them to speak Latin. Right, And so part of what we've had to do is also help our students and families navigate how do we sign up for free internet. And we were very excited just last week to launch a Sacramento Kids Connect partnership with Comcast to bring six months of free internet to thousands of families in the district. But beyond that, I would just say trauma is very real for our kids. Um, I've heard stories of separation anxiety, just having a family member leave the house for a couple minutes because because there is such a feeling of being triggered at a time when you are being told to shelter in place for families and children who have experienced any trauma in their lives. And there also is just this real challenge with anxiety and mental health issues. When you were able to access student support centers before, how do you move those supports online? Yesterday, we actually launched a virtual calming room with a whole host of wonderful resources for kids, everything from mindfulness music to meditation and yoga. These are things that we're doing in a virtual context that though less than ideal is a way we can continue to reach out to our children and our families and say we care and we know that academics only happen if you feel safe, if you're not hungry, and you feel like you're connected rather than alone. Wow. I, Larry, I, I want you to 
tell us what is the one thing, if there's one thing you're looking forward to in returning to the classroom, what is it? Well, certainly uh, being face to face in real time with students and being able to engage in the day to day work of building relationships and learning, that's where the magic happens. And I think that we'll leave it there. Mm. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.